Welcome to SPC Insights with Dr. Bill, simplifying SPC and statistical analysis. This video is going to take a look at how much data you need before you can calculate good control numbers. Control charts are often used to monitor a process. You plot your data over time, helps us determine when a process change has occurred, or perhaps if there's a special cause of variation present, like a point beyond the control limit. You make a control chart, you take data over time and you plot it. And then when you have enough data, whatever that is, you calculate your average and your control limits and you add those to the control chart and then you interpret it. So when do you have enough data? That's the subject of this video. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our process. It's, con it's 200 samples that we're going to use. It's in statistical control, as we'll show with an individual's chart which is important. And then we're going to take a look at the impact of the number of samples on control limits. And then we're going to introduce two terms, degrees of freedom and the coefficient of variation. These two terms are important because we're going to show how these two variables help ensure that the control limits we have are good, whatever that good means. So starting with our process. First, you always ask the question, it's a process in statistical control. There's a link to the data set provided in the YouTube description below. So here's the individual's chart for our data, the X chart. Each individual sample is plotted. There are 200 samples and we're plotting them all. And that's quite a bit of data. Then we're gonna calculate the average and the control limits and add them to the chart. The average is 99.5. The upper control limit's 129.5. And the lower control limit is 90, excuse me, 69.6. So that's our X chart. And then you interpret it. And our process is in control with respect to the X chart. We don't have any points beyond the control limits, and there are no patterns like seven in a row above or below the average. Now let's take a look at our moving range chart. And here's the moving range chart. What we're doing with this chart is we're calculating the range between consecutive samples. We're plotting those on the moving range chart. And there are 199 values because there's one less value because we're using the range between consecutive points. Then we calculate the average moving range, which is going to be very important, and the upper control limit. Average moving range is 11.27, upper control limits 36.81. So now we have our moving range chart, and it's a control also. We don't have any points beyond the limits or any pattern. So the key to good control limits is the average moving range. What variation are we looking at on the moving range chart? It's the range between consecutive sample or the variation in individual results. Now, sigma is a measure of the variation in those individual values, and you estimate it from our bar. And the average uh, moving range divided by D2 is our value of sigma. In this example, that's 9.99 is our value of sigma. The average moving range is also used to calculate the control limits for the X and the moving range chart. For the X chart, it's the X bar to plus or minus 2.66 times that average moving range. And for the moving range chart, our upper control limit's 3.27 times R bar. So the average range is really important when we take a look at our control limits. The quality of sigma impacts how good our control limits are. The more data you have, the better. Now let's take a look at how control limits change as the number of sample changes. And suppose the control limits are based on 5 instead of 200. Are those control limits as good as the 200? Which one has the more accurate control limits, the 5 samples or the 200 samples? Well, let's take a look at the individual's control chart based on the first 5 sample that's shown here. The upper and lower control limits are 57.7 and 142.9. Based on 200 samples, they were 69.6 and 129.5, so the 5 samples give much wider control limits. Can you use a control chart with only five samples? Yes, you can. You start with five and simply recalculate the control limits each time until you get to a point where the control limits aren't going to change much more with sample size, as we're going to show you here in just a few minutes. But you can start a control chart with five samples without a problem. Now let's say we use 20 samples instead of our five samples. So here's the X control chart based on the first 20 samples. Again, it's in statistical control. It's based on the, the first 20. The upper control limits and lower control limits, 69.4 and 132. And so what's happened to the control limits as we move from five samples to 20 samples? Well, they've gotten tighter, tighter than the four of the five samples. 
But what happens if we continue adding more data? We go from 20 on up. What's going to happen to the control limits? Well, eventually the control limits don't change very much because you have enough data for good control limits and they've leveled off. So let's take a look at the impact of the number of samples on control limits. Here's a, a table that shows that. The first column is a sample size, which shows us the average range and average uh, moving range. And you can see when we get to 20 to 30 samples, the control limits don't change very much. There's very little difference. The last column's percent difference compared to when we have 200 samples. And you can see when you get to about 20, well, there's not going to be a whole lot of changes in either the average range or the average moving range or the control limit. So we tend to have enough data to give good control limits from around 20 to 30 samples. So here's a chart that shows the impact of sample size on the average moving range. And you can see there's quite a bit of variation, but once you get down in that range of 20 to 30, it's beginning to level off. And that appears at 20 to 30 samples are probably sufficient to give us good control limits as long as the process is in control. Let's see how we're going to apply this to other situations, not only the individuals, but the X bar and R chart. We need to understand two terms, degrees of freedom and coefficient of variation. There's a relationship between these two, and that relationship helps you determine if you have enough data for good control limits. Degrees of freedom is the measure of how much data you have. It's not sample size, but it's related. The more degrees of freedom, the larger the sample size. So degrees of freedom depends on the amount of data used to calculate sigma. The larger the degrees of freedom, the better our estimate of sigma. Now, the coefficient of variation describes the amount of variability relative to, to the mean or the average. It's simply the sigma divided by the mean. So it's also a measure of the uncertainty in sigma. And the equation between the two Coefficient of variation is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 2 times the degrees of freedom. And here's a plot of COV versus degrees of freedom, and it looks a lot like the one we just looked at with uh, average moving range and the sample size. In the range of 10 to 30, the COV begins to level off. So 10 degrees of freedom corresponds to a COV of about 22%. 30 degrees of freedom corresponds to a coefficient of variation of about 13%. This applies for any estimate of sigma, and we, ought, we calculate sigma differently depending on the type of control chart we have. So we need a method of determining degrees of freedom for these various types of control charts. Remember our objective is to calculate COV, because you're going to set that. We want to have that a certain value, and you have to provide, you have to figure out degrees of freedom to do that. Dr. Wheeler helps us with this method he provides in his book advanced topics in statistical process control. So the average moving range is used to estimate sigma from individuals charts. You can estimate it using this formula, 0.62 times the number of samples minus one. Now the X bar and R chart, you subgroup data and the subgroup range is used to estimate sigma. And here's there's two equations. If your subgroup size is less than seven, the degrees of freedom is 0.9 times the number of subgroups divided by N minus one. There's the equation there for 7 to 10 as well. So this allows you then for either individuals or X bar and R charts to calculate degrees of freedom. And then we can use that knowledge to find our coefficient of variation. So here's our control chart with 20 samples. Simply put in our 20 and 2 degrees of freedom. It's 11.78 degrees of freedom. That corresponds to a coefficient of variation of 20.6%. Is that good enough? Is that what we want? Now remember, Here's the chart of COV times degrees of freedom. Around 20%, it begins to level off. And here's a table that shows that degrees of freedom in COV uh, versus the control limits. And you can see when you get to a sample size of 20 and a degrees of freedom, in this case 11.78, things begin to level off after that. The control limits don't change much as you go through that. COV at that point is 20.6%, as I said. And suppose you say, I, I want 15%, that's where I want to be. In that case, you're going to need degrees of freedom equal to 22.2. So a coefficient of variation of 15% corresponds to 22.2 degrees of freedom. How many samples do we need for that? Well, we can use that degrees of freedom formula for the individual's chart to find out the number of samples. In this case, n is equal to 36.8. So you need about 37 to 38 samples to get a COV of 15%. Now we can do the same thing with X bar and R chart. Suppose we have five samples per hour, we're forming a subgroup. So our subgroup size is five. 
and we say how many subgroups are needed for a COV of 15%. If that occurs about 22.2 degrees of freedom, we can put in our equation and solve for K. We need six subgroups and six times the subgroup size of five, so we need 30 total samples to get a coefficient of 15%. So, in summary, we started with our 200 sample process in statistical control, took a look at our various charts. We looked at the impact of the number of samples on control limits, how they got tighter as the control limits increased. We introduced our two terms, degrees of freedom and coefficient of variation. We talked about how we determine those degrees of freedom for the individuals in X-bar and R-chart, and how we use that knowledge to obtain good control limits. So thank you very much for, for watching the video or SPC Insights with Dr. Bill. Please click the YouTube button to, below to subscribe. Please visit our SPC Knowledge Base. Over 220 free articles. Make your own control charts using our SPC for Excel software. Thank you again so much for watching the video.